Good morning. Today we're with Ollie, half of the mighty Umami Mushrooms based down in Brighton. We're down in Birmingham and I'm with the boys from Rebel Fungi, Charlie and Amers. Today we're going to be looking at how to start a small scale mushroom business. What's up guys, it's Elliot from Urban Farm it here again. Over the coming few days we're going to be travelling all over the country, meeting different food growers and finding out what does it take and how do you start a food growing business. <laughs> You might have noticed that we're just in the uh, beautiful, albeit uh, residential garden down here in Brighton. And you know, almost shockingly, you guys have only been going for six months. Mm -hmm. So when you first had the dream, you didn't have a space available. How did you make it work? How did you create your space? So yeah, this is the Umami Mushroom HQ, small but mighty. And um, <laughs> yeah, as, as you say, I was, I've always been interested in, in fungi and growing and I was looking for a space in Brighton and a space became available so this was a completely derelict garage mm -hmm. just a stone brick wall and we spent the best part of January concreting the floor insulating the walls putting in the electrics yeah. making sure that it was contained small but contained yeah. so that we could effectively kind of cultivate on a small scale some yeah. gourmet mushrooms brilliant so you know it's, it goes to show that you don't need to jump straight in with a, a primary commercial space. You can make something work. We saw uh, some other guys, the Rebel Fungi guys, did a bit of outdoor growing. That would have been an option for you as well. But thankfully you had the space and um, when we go on in there, you'll be impressed with how far it's come. Yeah, man, I'm looking forward to showing you. It's uh, <laughs> by all means. Yeah, let's jump, take a look. Jump in. <laughs> it might be on the edge of something from a sci-fi film uh, with all this tinfoil and peculiar bits and pieces around. But what you've created is a really dynamic, small, functional space. For those who aren't really familiar what the inside of a small-scale mushroom farm looks like, why don't you just sort of walk us around and we can take a look at some of the key pieces of kit and then, you know, in a little while we'll see how you do it. You walk, you walk to the door and we've got silver foil up on the windows. We've got <laughs> space looking tents. No one knows what the hell we're up to. But yes, as you say, it is a small but functional urban farm. Um, we, we started from scratch, as I said, we, we gutted the place, we, we fitted it out to make sure that all the extremities are um, contamination proof or wiped down, so that was the first thing. So we just wanted a contained space. Mm -hmm. Then it was about keeping costs to a minimum and reusing um, bits and pieces as much as we could. So as you see, we've got a stainless steel, stainless steel table, which of course is very good for cleanliness, but that was reversioned. Tents we got as cheap as possible. M the majority of the bits and pieces in terms of substrate, mm -hmm. we try and get for free or, or get them from farmers. Yeah. Um, so we do, we do everything in here. We, we do our mixing. Yeah. As you can see, we have our two um, contained internal spaces. One is for colonization. Yeah. So it's for the mycelium to grow. We've got our original heat sealer. So it's a <laughs> ribbon sealer, pressure yeah, activated. And uh, that dial is living by physics of its own, I think. We had a lot of experiments with that and uh, we found a few problems, so we upgraded to this more expensive and wider uh, pressure sealer. Um, you'll notice when you do look for these online, there is a price jump and it's worth going to the one just above the price jump I advise. Um, it's much more professional and we have so little failure on this. Yeah. This is a consistent piece of kit where people say, don't scrimp on it. You know, overheating is a problem. When you're there churning out bags, there's nothing worse than having a pause process to, to, to cool down your kit. Exactly, we're, lo we're looking to do things effectively and well. And so something like this, which allows a bag to be completely sealed without any air gap is, is exactly what you need. Otherwise, everything gets contaminated. One thing that we really enjoyed making, so a lot of this is DIY. So Ed, say, Ed, Ed is a very handy man. I'd say just, for a bit of context, Ed's, Ed's an engineer. <laughs> Ed, is, Ed is an engineer and, and loves to, to build to and tinker. tinker. So we built this DIY humidifier, which we absolutely love. And so we've got a pond fogger in there. We've got um, a normal uh, bathroom instructor fan. Yep. Then pipes in, drip water flows back in and it keeps it nicely at the right kind of humidity. Yeah. We've got um, regulators in there. We've got a small fan. So we have everything you need to effectively cultivate gourmet mushrooms of a variety of species. We, if we start at the back, we'll talk about the pasteurization process, which is the first. 
Well, as we've touched on, uh, there's huge variation in your process depending on species, availability of substrate, etc., etc. Uh, you guys started with quite a forgiving mushroom in the oyster mushroom, and you've gone for one of the more beautifully basic uh, pasteurization methods. If it's all right, could you just talk us through what substrate you use for the oysters, uh, the method you use, and, and sort of how that developed, how you chose to settle on that? Yeah, certainly. So when we started the mushroom farm, it was important for us because we were growing a, a, a mushroom for consumption that was a healthy product and we wanted a sustainable or as, as sustainable a process as possible. We wanted to keep everything as low tech as we could. So we did a lot of research online. There are numerous different methods. A lot of people sterilize the substrate to make sure it's very clean. But with oyster mushrooms, we have opted for cold water pasteurization mm. because it doesn't require any energy yep. and it's, it's highly effective for mm -hmm. this type of strain. So we use a, a variety of substrate, but the majority um, of, of what we use is just chopped straw. We're using straw because it's the easiest to access, but we've also tried mahogany sawdust and mm. coffee. And so I was really inspired again, when I was back in Austria, there were some young guys in Vienna that were just doing that exact model, taking used coffee grounds, yeah. and there's something romantic about it. Yeah, so, it really is, yeah. So we, we started with that, and so it, I suppose it depends what we have available, but yeah, so it's a, for, for currently what we do, it's a perfectly simple and effective method of cleaning the substrate ready for the mushrooms to, to chow down and take over. Uh, it's done with quick lime, mm -hmm. and it's done with water. So how much water, how much straw, how much lime do you use in your Yeah, mix? so again, there's a hell of a lot of resources online and people will have different kinds of recipes and methods. So effectively what we do is we know that six pillowcases of straw. <laughs> so it's a bit... Bucket grove, yeah, bucket method. It's a bit like yeah. this, but, it's, but, it's, but it works. So, and then we know that a, a, a standard cup of lime <laughs> will do about, and this is about 90 litres worth of liquid. Yeah. So it's very finger in the air, but it does us. And as we start to move into further strains, mm. we'll need to be more technical and more proficient at measurements. But for what we're doing here, works a treat. And no doubt, you know, that your mix ratio is going to vary depending on the, the, what substrate you're using and, and what your water chemistry is like in your local area. Uh, just to kind of add to that, I found that, that for me, about a one gram of, of, of quitline per litre of water generally is about right. But mm -hmm. it's not really a fixed science. There's plenty of variability. You know, the, the room for error is quite broad. So the main thing is just to get out, have a go and, and, and see the results and often do side by side. So, you know, we've got our substrate, we've chosen it, we've pasteurised it. Next thing's incubation. Uh, let's go have a little chat about that. Yeah, let's do All it. Right, nice let's one. Do it. And we, we started with buckets um, the first time you were here. To be honest, it just turned into a nightmare cleaning them out. Yeah. Every week you're having to wash out 50 buckets and we're looking to minimise our time input and yep. maximise the aspects that we're curious about and we want to we wanna progress. So mm. bags at the moment is is number one for us. So uh, we've now got a beautiful block and we've got our clean straw in, it's inoculated. After that, into the incubation space. Yep. Why don't you sort of tell us um, what temperatures you keep at, how long things typically take in this space, and you know any real red flags to look out for when the blocks are in there. Yeah, completely. So the aim for this area is to keep it within a certain range in terms of temperature. Um, at the moment, we've got um, some winter oysters and some white elm growing in there, so we keep them roughly between a kind of 80, 18 and 23. Mm. Um, in, we started in winter, so we were having to have a fluctuation of a heater turning on and off. So as you can see, we've got um, some gauges that just give us uh, humidity for in there. And well worth the investment. In massively so. I would also say that an upgrade to an ink bird would be a smart move. Um, but for this room, it's about keeping it clean, free of contamination and at the right temperature and, and roughly having an in and flow and outflow of air just mm -hmm. to take away the condox. I think that's one of the, the things I'd like to point out now, and it's something that we see all the time with, with our, our kit customers. Often, you know, uh, an a imperfect temperature for incubation is not so much of an issue as massive fluctuation. Mm -hmm. You know, like any other living organism, changes in temperature are the thing that stress mushrooms out. So if you can regulate that and keep it consistent, then you won't go far wrong. And I would also, I think what's interesting is we've kind of locked down a process and tried to slim down the amount of time everything takes. But there is a beauty, I would say, in growing mushrooms somewhat with the seasons could be outside exactly. and also varying the substrate so you've got a second generation 
um, that you've taken from a master to then give it different substrates and different conditions and it keeps the, the purity of the genetics a little stronger. So as yeah. you go deeper into this world, into a real like kind of mycologist <laughs> head world, there's, there's other, there's many different when variants. You start but peeling, at the moment, this, yeah. is, this works for us. When you start peeling the onion, you don't really tend to stop. Yep. And as, so we got two, we're holding two blocks. Yep. That was mixed a week ago and has been in here. Um, as you can see, the mycelium is nicely spreading across the substrate. This is now two and a half weeks old, and this is, is ready to fruit. Yeah. yeah. So when you're looking at your blocks in that space, what are a couple of uh, key indicators of problems that you might see? We've learned from our mistakes 100%. So contamination, contamination, contamination. <laughs> we always knew when we started this was going to be a big thing. But you start to see, say, if your blocks have too much water, you'll start to see certain types of contamination on the bottom. Yep. There's, there's different types. You can get green mold and you can get kind of like hairy, hairy mm -hmm. things. So for us, it's about coming in here and always, like, quickly, every couple of days, doing a once over, making sure mm -hmm. that there's no obvious signs of contamination. If there is, they get evacuated pronto. When you're stretched for time, when you're stressed and tired, it's really easy to just leave blocks and incubate because the bags aren't open, they're not fruiting, you know, you think stuff's not happening quickly, but actually that's probably the key time to keep eyes on, 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 your, on your bags. And um, a little something that I've found is that if, you, if you're looking at the bags and you see metabolites, i.e. brown liquids, uh, any kind of um, residue that's not <laughs> straight contamination, that can be a, a sure sign that something is about to kick off. As the mycelium fights these infections, it tends to produce more metabolites as it's stressed. So metabolites are, although not the end of the world, certainly something to look out for. Yep. Right, so here we are inside tent uh, number one. And as we were talking earlier, you get this um, kind of like temperature gradient from top to bottom. So we've got different species open at the top. Our king oysters, which are top fruiting, but then if we can side fruit, uh, we cut the side of the bag and we can stack them down the full uh, length of these racks. Amazon basic racks, fairy lights, and you don't actually need a massive spectrum of light. So we found these for 11.99 delivery next day. Um, you can program them so the mushrooms can have a party. Um, but that vent there that's hanging through the tent, that goes out the side and then it like crawls all the way around the top wall to a skylight nearby where we've got a modified bathroom extractor fan and that's on a timer plug as well so it cycles the air sufficiently for our mushrooms. To talk through the whole growing process I've had to move a grand total of about three steps uh, and that is that's really good. Oyster mushrooms like things consistent, like consistent conditions. If we look at the winter oyster 2191 on our website as an example it likes to fruit around 16 degrees, it likes consistent 90% humidity uh, but you know, with these kind of DIY setups, there's often issues that arise. Within your fruiting chamber, what are some problems that have arisen? What has been the symptoms of those? And then how did you deal with them? Mm -hmm. So uh, firstly, the perspective from that side of the room, completely different, isn't it? Completely different. <laughs> it's thrown you off a bit. <laughs> so one, one aspect of setting this farm up we liked was the fact that we wanted to do everything DIY. Yeah. So we knew that we were gonna come across difficulties just by very nature. So we, we built this, um, fruiting chamber ourselves. As you can see, it's effectively just a, an outdoor greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And then we specced it out. So we've come across pretty much every difficulty you can face when it comes to <laughs> fruiting of mushrooms. So, so what we were trying to do is keep everything contained and mm -hmm. controlled. So it's having a temperature that's slightly lower than um, colonization. It's to remove CO2. And it's also to keep humidity at around about the 90% point. So we have the DIY humidifier, mm -hmm. um, which we also have a hygrometer that's measuring humidity level. So it took a bit of time to balance that out. So a issue we faced was mushrooms drying out. We also went too high and had rot. So that was a big one when it came to humidity. Yep. CO2, we had to, so we've got an extraction fan that runs on a timer at the back that takes out of the room. We weren't running that quick enough. Um, and also what, the thing, interesting thing is, as you change one variable, it, it then, affects it the then others. affects everything else. You've got to think about it as a contained ecosystem. So CO2 was a bit of an issue. So we've got a leggy fruit, which still tastes great. It's still good for you, but doesn't look the same. So just to give you an idea, a leggy fruit is one that effectively grows too long. It's, a, it's the equivalent of a plant reaching for light. Um, if your market is high quality gourmet, which it is for you guys, mm -hmm. the traditional, nice, beautifully shaped oyster mushroom is what you're after. So a leggy fruit isn't really saleable. Temperature as well, we, we, as I say, we started in winter. We've now moved forward to an absolute heat wave in the UK. Mm -hmm. So it, fluctu it has fluctuated quite considerably in terms of 
external to the building, this room, and then our controlled room. So we've had issues with it going too high mm. and fruits kind of perishing. So lots of issues with this, but what's nice is that now that we've been running it effectively for about four months, um, doing fruits for local restaurants and so on, we've, we've hit that nice equilibrium for yeah. our unique space, let's say. Yeah. So I noticed that you've got a, a controller. You know, we talk about low-tech mushroom farming. This might actually seem quite high-tech compared to what a lot of guys are doing. Did you decide to, to, to go for a controller from the very start? If you didn't, you know, at what point were you like, hang on a minute, we need to, to step this up? So from the research and from speaking to a lot of other farmers in the UK and abroad, we went straight in and, and got one of these. Mm. Doesn't cost much at all, and it just allows you to have an easy visual representation of what's going on in, mm -hmm. in both environments. So there are even some that can talk to your phone and you can monitor remotely. So exactly, if you, you are in, you hungry for a bit of headspace, um, you know you can you can still rest assured. The idea of growing mushrooms outside when you're limited for space inside is quite appealing. You know, it's a great way to maximise your growing space and up your production. This is just about as simple as it comes, isn't it? And no doubt you've had some challenges along the way. Yeah. You know, how, what was it like when you were choosing the right tent, um, choosing where to put it, and you know, how has that kind of led to maybe a couple of issues today? Well, we thought it was going to be quite a simple approach, really, in that we were just going to get whatever grow tent was available, equip it the way we'd seen other people equip theirs on YouTube videos, and it had all run fine. It didn't quite turn out that way. Some of our results weren't optimal, but we did notice some of our grow at home trial packs were uh, growing really well in natural light mm -hmm. so we decided to give this outdoor polytunnel a go and it's uh, it has produced really well for us to be fair and it's nice to have the split of a lot of outdoor production with some indoor production mm. still so we are getting the best of both worlds in a way yeah so when you were setting it up what sort of items did you choose to put in there what were your priorities uh, our priority for in here was just making sure that airflow was decent through the, our side vets which are part of the tunnel anyway and that we had adequate racking for all our blocks to be well spaced out. Mm -hmm. Our next concern from there is humidity. So right now we just use a hose for that really. It, all of our floor is wood chip in here. Mm. So it does quite a good job at holding the water. That's a great idea. It's kind of a passive humidifier. Yeah. What is it that you use your quarantine tent for? Uh, originally it was just for blocks that had contamination, but didn't look badly enough contaminated to be thrown out. Yeah. So they maybe had a few spots. We didn't want them in the same environment as our other blocks. Mm -hmm. We put them in our quarantine tent, kind of like with our grow at home packs, the quarantine tent produced some really good mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that led us towards the polytunnel. Yeah. I think just a closing note on this whole process of stepping up from no tech to mid tech to high tech, whatever you want to call it. Um, I found it in commercial food production, particularly with fish and, and things like this, that you can't substitute a pair of eyes. You know, you can you can look at the data as much as you like, but sometimes, you know, eyes will tell all. So there is always gonna be a, a need to be in situ and, and to look at your, at your crops. Well, it's all well and good producing fantastic products, but ultimately this is a business. Certainly in the early days, it can be quite challenging for people to, you know, really understand what, where, what the demand is, where the demand is, and, and kind of like what sort of products to start with. How did you guys go about appraising, you know, your local market, deciding whether to be um, selling, a, you know, over a large area or a small area? How did that process develop? So Brighton is Ed and my home city. So we grew up here. We know that it, there's a lot of students, there's a lot of young families, there's a, there's, there's a kind of a lean towards kind of creativity and kind of holistic ways of life. So we knew that Brighton was going to be a prime market when it came to gourmet mushrooms. So we, we spoke to a bunch of restaurants and cafes to gauge whether there'd be interest of buying fresh mushrooms. This was, a, this was ahead of... This of, was ahead of time. Yeah. Um, and we were blown away with the fact that, firstly, people didn't realise these mushrooms existed. Wow. And secondly, they were, they were going to be very excited that they were going to be local and it would only be a 10 minute cycle to get them to mm -hmm. uh, to the chefs so we we basically did a, a local area appraisal we then looked at the wider market um, in terms of fresh mushrooms and also um, the grow your own packs how did you decide what price to put on your mushrooms it's it's an interesting one because in all types of market there are different ways of approaching it you can look to undercut the average competitor you can look to distinguish yourself and go for a higher price point and be unique so we we when it came to the fruits selling of fruits there is 
or there was one other provider from out of the city that had started to do so. And so we knew his price point, mm -hmm. and then we iterated from there, let's say. <laughs> I can't tell you if we went higher or lower, but we, we, we based ourselves on what someone else was doing, yeah. and then spoke to potential customers. Just to give guys an idea of a snapshot in time, like what, what does a kilo of oyster mushrooms sell direct to a, to a restaurant for? A kilo of oyster mushrooms can range, for, it depends whether people are buying on bulk or not, but it can range from eight to 18, 20 pound cool. on the kilo. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a high which, value product. Which, which is in terms of, you've spoken and you know this well greater than me, in terms of people that are farmers that are growing um, produce, it's a pretty good market. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I mean, that's encouraging enough. <laughs> So, <laughs> the big question, what do you know now that you wish you'd known then? What do I know now that I wish I did then? Probably about the uh, these products, to be fair, the various other products that we could have been doing from further back. Mm. Like you were saying, to capitalise on the whole process and make every cap valuable. I think if we'd known that it was going to be as successful and go as well, we could have gotten to like phases and level ups in the business scaling issues we could have attacked that in a more economical way mm. so you've seen already we've got a lot of pairs of equipment where we've got the small and then the big yeah and we spent twice where sometimes if we just backed ourselves a bit more yeah. i think that's probably something that will hopefully not kill us with too much confidence in the coming months <laughs> but i think we'll be a bit more brash about those decisions and say why not yeah because contamination is a big um is a big problem or can be a big problem if a process isn't right that we had a lot of wastage along the way and that mm. meant that we were we were losing money and it, and it cost us so i would have started on a smaller scale and mm. i would have just probably reached out to other small scale farmers a little earlier because yeah. there's loads of good information online but you've got to pick and choose and lots of people have different opinions so speaking to someone that's doing it mm. that gets their hands dirty to yeah. find that little kind of tidbit is, is vital. So don't rush and ask the right questions. No doubt, yeah. Brilliant, well look. But get started, get started. Ah, that's it, yeah. we, we are now more infused than we were when we started. The main thing, if you're really doubting what your results are gonna be, and you're obsessing over what perfect is, and we've talked about this off camera mm. as well, but try a lot of different side-by-side -side runs, be a bit more scientifically minded about it, and take the stress out of it. Mm. Run a few variations and see where the results lead you. You might not even get great results on that first trial of five or six things, yeah. but you'll see one that was slightly better, and just go with it. There really is no perfect way to approach anything, and there's no substitute for learning from results. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, look, that's it. Rebel Fungi. It's been great, guys. Thank you so much. Ollie, your mommy mushrooms. Thank you so much, mate. Absolute pleasure. pleasure. Not at all.